Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. Today, I will not be subjecting you to another creepy animation of myself introducing the topic. Ha! Just kidding. Before we get back to Maui apps, I felt it was important to cover nullable types in C-sharp. You may or may not have used nullables before .NET 6, but if you're like me, you are realizing that .NET 6 is all about nullable types. That's because Nullable World is enabled by default in every .NET 6 project. So rather than just let you put up with all the warnings you're no doubt seeing in your .NET 6 projects, I figured we should take a little time to understand Nullables and how to benefit from them. It's a Nullable World. We're just living in it. This mysterious world explained, coming right up on the .NET Show. So before we get into nullable reference types, let's talk about nullable value types, which have been around since c -sharp 2. Why would you use a nullable value type? Well, you want to add a null state to a value type like a Boolean if it makes sense. So if you had a nullable of bool, let's say, and it could have three states, true, false, and null. Now, why? When? What's going on here? Well, typically you'd use nullables as fields in a DTO or a model that represents a nullable database column. So if you have an int or a bit or some other SQL column that allows nulls, and you want to represent that in your model or your DTO, you make it a nullable. Another time you would use nullable value types is any time you find yourself using values to represent the value not being set, like negative one for integers, or date time min value for date times. And if you find yourself doing this, that's a smell. And if you're not going to use a nullable value type here, it might result in some weirdness across your application. So I say, other than these situations, don't use nullable value types. And especially if a value type can never be null, like if it's been initialized, such as in year equals 2021. You've initialized it. It's not going to be null. Nobody can set it to null. There's no reason to make it nullable. Now let's just do a little demo of nullable value types. So here's how you do it. Nullable of whatever the type is. In this case, it's int. Now you can also do this. That means it's a nullable value type. Either way, it works the same. Now, if I want to do some math with this and return a result, that result also has to be a nullable type. All right? Now it's telling me, cannot implicitly convert type nullable double to double. So you see what happens. Once you start down the path to nullable world, there's no turning back. <laughs> let's just make sure this runs. And it does. All right, let's get this stuff out of the way. Let's talk about structs. Here's a struct called year month. You've got a non-nullable ID integer. You have a nullable int for years. And you have a calculated property, months, that is also a nullable int. And it's just going to multiply years by 12. All right. So here we're creating a new year month struct. We're setting years to 2. And we can test for null two ways. Now remember, months is a nullable int. So we can use the has value property. And if it has a value, that means it's not null. We can also use this is operator. Now this is a little strange, and it was to me the first time I saw it. So if months is int, and then some variable that you create by name, then it's not null. 
And what's more is the value is copied into this new variable. Now, whatever you call it, just make sure it's the same. Doesn't matter, but when you access it, it's gotta be the same. So let's run this. Two ways to test, two outputs. Now what happens if we change this to null? Because years is nullable. Nothing complains. That's good. Months is null. Now struct is a value type, right? So can I do this? Well, this line doesn't complain, but wow, certainly a lot of problems here. And it won't even compile. Look at this. Nullable year month does not contain a definition for years. Well, yeah, it does. Well, what, what's really going on is you can't do that. And this is the error that you're getting. Um, does that mean I can't also do this? Correct. Same thing. Bottom line, you can't make a struct nullable. I talked about records before. What if I made it a record struct? Hmm, nope, not gonna work. Okay then, how about a record class? Or just a record? Mm, yeah, that works, because now it's a reference type, and reference types can all be nullable. So if you've got a struct and you wanna make it nullable, consider changing it to a class or a record class. So I'm gonna wrap all this up and talk about nullable reference types, which are new in C-sharp 8. Now, as of this recording, we're on C-sharp 10, but this happened in C-sharp 8. But some new things happened in .NET 6. If you take a look at the csproj file, nullables are enabled by default. And this may have come as a surprise for some of you who converted your .NET 5 apps to .NET 6 or just created new .NET 6 apps and all of a sudden you're getting all these warnings. We'll tell you what, let's just turn that off right here. If you have existing code, when you wanna introduce nullable contexts, which this does, this makes your whole project allow for nullable reference types, you can do it one piece at a time. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that. So the confusion with the name, because value types weren't nullable before we made them nullable, so they became nullable value types. Makes sense. But all reference types are nullable. All reference types can be null. So what do we mean when we say nullable reference types? Well, if you use the question mark, that makes a reference type nullable. And what we mean by nullable reference type is that now we can make our intent more clear at design time. The goal is to reduce null reference exceptions from happening at runtime. Everybody knows about those, right? It's the bane of object-oriented development, nulls. And this is where our F-sharp friends go neener, neener, neener at us C-sharp developers because everything is immutable by default there is no such thing as a null in F sharp. But we have to deal with nulls. So nullable reference types allows for design time warnings that will help you make better decisions. Now, intent, I get back to intent. When we intend a reference to either never be null or maybe be null, then we can make it a nullable type. The compiler warnings help us to get rid of null reference exceptions by doing static analysis. And you're gonna see what those warnings look like. You probably have already seen them. Some you can ignore, and some you ignore at your own peril. But if you follow them and you take the suggestions, eventually you'll get to a point where there's only a very slight chance that you'll get a null reference exception. Right now, all bets are off. A reference type that's not nullable is null oblivious. Unlike value types, you can use nullable reference types anywhere 
that you use a reference type. The underlying IL does not change. However, once you go down the path to nullable land, <laughs> you can't come back, right? It touches everything. The whole meaning of your code changes. All right, let's look at a class. This is a person class. We have an ID that's not nullable. We have a string that is nullable, but it's complaining. It says the annotation for nullable reference type should only be used in code with a nullable annotations context. Yeah, you remember what I did over here? I commented out, nullable everywhere. So how do we get it back? Like this, folks. Nullable enable. I recommend that if you are converting code over to use nullables, that you do this on a file by file basis. You can even enable and disable. And now you can see because we're disabled, we have that same problem again. But it makes sense to do this at the top of your files. And that way, when a particular file, all the code is working, then you can go back and change it for the whole program. All right, so we have ID and name that are not nullable types, and we have a nullable string, notes. Now, if I took off the nullable here, we're going to get a complaint in the constructor, which only maps these ID and name variables to our properties. And it's telling us non nullable property notes must contain a non null value when exiting the constructor. Consider making it nullable. Okay. Well, that's what we did. Otherwise, we have to do something like this, which defeats the whole purpose. So we're going to make this nullable. Now let's write some code around it. So here I've got a new list of person called people. I'm adding a new person, Isadora Jar. Adding another person, huge ass. Did I say that out loud? Sorry. Uh, and that I've created a variable for, and I've set the notes property. And then I've added hue to people. Ignore this for a minute. We have a third person, pick up and drop off. And we've got our three person objects added to people. Now we're just going through that list and writing out to the console each person's name and notes. Notice, notes is null for two out of three of these people. However, we don't have any problem with this. That's because console write line can deal with nulls. Let's watch. So we're just showing nothing where notes is null. Now I could annotate this with an attribute that does the same thing as a question mark, allow null. What's interesting about it is that it doesn't show up in the IntelliSense as a nullable string just as a string, but we can use that attribute in place of this guy, and it'll still run. I want to go back to the way we had it, and we'll move on. Now this commented code checks to see if a property is nullable. And what I've done is I've created an extension method for object. Now this is cool because this not only demonstrates nullable reference types, but also nullable value types. I have a nullable bool that I can return. Is property nullable? And you use this on any object so it works everywhere. You can press a period on any object and call is property nullable, passing in the name of the property, and it'll return a nullable boolean. So it only returns null if it can't find the property by name. 
Otherwise, we're creating this nullability info context, which is in system reflection. And we're creating that from the property info. And then the property is considered nullable if null info write state is nullable. So here I'm getting the return value from person two is property nullable, passing in notes. I want to know if the notes property is nullable. If it comes back null, that property doesn't exist. If it comes back true, it's nullable. False, it's not nullable. And person two dot notes is nullable. So interestingly, let's just mess up the name here. Try again. That property doesn't exist. So there's a really good demo of when you would want to use a nullable value type. So let's add a numbers property. This is a nullable list of int called numbers. And up here, after we add person two, we're going to look at the numbers count for person two. And of course, because it's not initialized, but it is nullable, I get this warning. Numbers may be null here, right? And in fact, it is. So it knows. Okay, so if I run this, it's going to get a null reference exception. But at least I was expecting it, right? So I could always do this. If I use that question mark there, this basically says if numbers is not null, then write the count. Otherwise, don't write anything. Yeah, numbers count nothing. There's the nothing there, just blank. Well, that, that doesn't sit well with me. So what I really want to know is, is it null? And if it's null, I want to tell the user it's null. I want to show it somehow. So we can do this. If person2.numbers is null, and by the way, this is the most efficient test, not this, right? That's the equality operator. Is is much more efficient. If numbers is null, we're going to instantiate numbers. And now, numbers count zero. Interestingly enough, if we remove this, no warnings. Because Rosalind is smart enough to know that if it's null, we're going to make it not null. And so by the time it gets here, there's no way it can be null. So this is what I mean by static code analysis. Now, it can't go all the way down. For example, this code right here blows up at runtime. I have a new string array, 10 items. And then I try to access the first item. Well. I don't get any errors here, so it only goes so far. That's going to blow up. Yeah, there it is. So there's a more efficient way to do this using the no coalescing assignment. What this essentially says is if person2.numbers is null, then we're going to set it to a new list event. Also, IntelliSense is smart enough to know that this is not null now. But what if I don't want to set it to a new list event? What if I just want to report whether or not it's null? Check this out. Here we're going to use the null conditional operator on numbers. And if numbers is not null, we're going to display the count to string. If it is null, we're going to display numbers is null. Yeah, that's much better. That way I didn't really affect the object at all. I just wanted to report whether or not it was null. Now there's some definitely required viewing if you want to go deeper, and deeper you can. I recommend this YouTube video by John Skeet. And folks, that's all I got for you today. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Please visit blazertrain.com and the.netshow.com for more great content.